Transparency in 3D and computer graphics is a notoriously difficult subject to get right. If you're not careful about it, you can end up in a bunch of different sorts of awkward situations where different transparent objects, or particularly semi-transparent objects such as these inexplicable glass cubes, will uh, mask out some of the objects that are drawn behind them. And this is a uh, this is a very trippy effect if you look at it for too long. Uh, this is because of the way that the depth buffer works. So for each pixel on the surface, the depth between it and the camera is going to be encoded in the depth buffer. And then if you draw something else, uh, its depth is going to be tested against the depth buffer to see if it's closer and if it should consequently be drawn. And this is uh, this is fine for opaque objects, but it does cause some problems for 3D objects, which you, for transparent objects, which you might expect to be able to see through, uh, such as this 50% uh, uh, transparent glass. One option to deal with this is to handle uh, semi-transparent 3D surfaces in 3D the same way that you would in 2D by sorting all the objects in your game and drawing them in order from uh, farthest away from the camera to closest to the camera. And that can work. So if I were to go back and uncomment uh, this code, which is going to sort uh, all these cube objects in order from uh, based on distance to the camera, uh, that can work. It can be a little bit difficult in 3D if you have a lot of semi-transparent objects uh, because, well, if there's a lot of them, it can be expensive to sort them uh, when your camera's moving around constantly. And also, depending on where you stand, uh, objects which um, are closer or farther from the camera can still have uh, bits of geometry that... If I stand precisely here, we can see some lovely fighting going on. Within the same object, it is possible to have individual bits of geometry that are farther or closer to the camera than individual bits of geometry in another object. So what you'd really have to do to resolve the fighting here is to basically sort every surface uh, based on its distance from the camera and not just every object. I think we can agree that that would be impractical for a bunch of reasons. And I uh, made a whole video a, a while ago, I think about a year or so ago, about why 3D about why transparency in 3D is just kind of cursed all around. And I will recommend that you go and watch that if you haven't seen it because I don't want to retread too much old ground here. But today we're going to be taking on a different way of solving this problem, and that is going to be using dithering. So I recently made a video on dither patterns, and a dither pattern is what you see here. Uh, you've probably seen it if you've hung around pixel art for long enough. It's very common in pixel art to create the illusion of a smooth gradient from a limited number of colors. What you see here, for example, is uh, a, um, an apparently smooth-ish transition from black to white, but the only actual colors in this image are 100% black and 100% white, and they're just blended together uh, in um, basically chunks of varying densities so that some regions of this image have more black and less white, and other regions of this image have more white and less black. And it comes out looking like a not perfectly smooth gradient, but certainly a much more smooth one than just a uh, binary two color on or off black and white image. There do appear to be a couple of like off by one errors that are just resolving as like red pixels up in the corner over here, but we're not gonna think about that right now. So how on earth can we use something like this to resolve transparency in 3D? And so to answer that, we're going to have to think about what actually the dither pattern is doing. We're going to have to set aside the colors for a minute and we're going to have to think about what this is actually doing. So the dither pattern is simply going to it's going to select one of two potential values based on some probability. So for this grayscale image as a whole, the input into the dither function is going to be basically just the brightness of a pixel. And it's going to return either one or zero hey. with a certain probability based on that brightness. So over up in the top left corner of this image, in this corner, the brightness of each pixel in this gradient is very low. So on average over like some area of multiple pixels, uh, the odds of the dither function returning a 0 is going to be greater than the odds of the dither function returning a 1. And over here in the opposite corner, it's going to be the opposite of that. The dither function is more likely to return a 1, which is going to correspond to a white pixel, than it is to uh, return a 0, which is going to correspond to a black pixel. And if we take that abstract concept of a dither pattern and apply it to transparency, uh, we can create some interesting effects. And armed with this technique, uh, we will be able to create a, um, an illusion of transparency, which does not actually involve alpha blending, but it involves selectively discarding pixels with a certain probability based on the, uh, the alpha of a particular surface. So instead of uh, for each transparent pixel uh, alpha blending it with whatever was drawn behind it, uh, each pixel is still going to be drawn at 
either 100% opacity or discarded entirely and not written to the depth buffer. And with more opaque surfaces, uh, more of the original pixels are going to be preserved and only a few are going to be discarded, uh, while with more transparent surfaces, uh, only a few of the original pixels are going to be preserved and more of them are going to be discarded. And uh, again, here, the pixels that are preserved are still going to have 100% transparency and there's going to be no alpha blending going on. Uh, there's just going to be not that many of them and they're going to be more or less uh, evenly distributed over the surface of the semi-transparent uh, surface. This is known as screen door transparency. Uh, if you've ever looked through a screen door, you can probably imagine why. Uh, generally, you can see through a screen door or some other kind of fine mesh, but it will tend to slightly darken uh, the image of whatever's on the other side of the screen. And if you get up close to it, you can uh, you can work out why that is. And there's going to be a similar principle at work in our um, in our dithered alpha or our screen door transparency or whatever you'd like to call it. It's worth mentioning that this is not a visual style which is going to work for all games. Uh, this is a visual style which is probably going to be more uh, preferable for games with a more pixel arty aesthetic, uh, a more low fidelity uh, aesthetic. Uh, games of a higher level of visual fidelity will probably look pretty weird if you try to do this. I am not doing this in Wizard X uh, for transparency because I, I do think it looks a little bit weird in that game, but if you're making a game that's going for a deliberate like PS1 aesthetic, then you are probably more likely to uh, to be interested in this sort of thing. So how are we going to actually do this? Um, in my um, in my test project, this is basically a, a, a slightly modified version of that old uh, 3D alpha video that I made, except that there's going to be a couple different block types uh, with more or less transparent glass sides. And I'm, do I'm doing this because I do want to be able to show off um, basically differences in kind with different uh, levels of transparency. And uh, by the way, if you haven't seen the uh, previous video on dithering, I would recommend going and watching that. I'm not going to explain how this works beyond what I've already said at the beginning of this one. And I am just going to be copying and pasting in the dither code. So if you don't know how dither works, uh, go and watch that video. So I'm going to start by going into the uh, sh SHD underscore 3D stuff. This is just the uh, shader that pretty much everything in the world is drawn with. And I'm going to go and uh, indeed copy and paste in my 8x8 dither function. And this is going to, um, again, return a, uh, a number between 0 and 1. I uh, looked up in the Bayer matrix based on some input, which uh, for all intents and purposes might as well be the uh, 2D position of the screen, of the pixel on the screen. Uh, scrolling down to the bottom, uh, the way that alpha testing is actually working here is we're just using regular alpha blending, so the alpha channel of GL underscore frag color is going to be blended with whatever happens to be behind it in the depth buffer, and we are doing some testing, some alpha testing. Uh, if the alpha is a very small value, we're just going to discard the fragment entirely. So what I can instead do is let's just go and define a float, I have caps lock on apparently, float dither value equals dither 8 by 8, uh, and... Uh, dither 8x8 is going to take a 2D position as an input. Uh, again, I'm just going to use the basically the screen coordinates, gl underscore frag coord dot xy. Uh, this is going to be a number between 0 and 1. I would say it's a random number between 0 and 1, but it's really not random at all. It is going to be a uh, repeating uh, pattern basically tiled over the screen defined by the Bayer matrix. And for our threshold, in the original dither video, we were just using the color and we were basically setting the color to 100% or 0% based on uh, the value of the dither function. But instead, I can say if gl underscore frag color dot alpha is less than dither underscore value, then we can discard that fragment. We can throw it away entirely, prevent it from being written to the depth buffer. Uh, else gl underscore frag color dot alpha equals 1.0. We can set the alpha to 100%. I guess um, doesn't really make a matter, make a difference to the final image, but we can uh, actually put that in, in an else block. And that is all we really need to do here uh, to have dithered screen door transparency. So if I were to run around, uh, we can see that if you look closely, you can see like the like the missing pixels. But if you just uh, sort of look at it without really scrutinizing the scene, uh, it looks reasonably convincing as actual transparency. Uh, for each of these objects, you can see the objects that are um, behind them, or in some cases, like, inside them, based on how the scene is constructed. Um, it's definitely not perfect. 
it is possible for like certain pixels to just be completely transparent um, if they line up in precisely the right way, and you can just sort of see all the way uh, through to the to the sky boxes. If somebody like shot a bullet through uh, these objects, and you can like see sky behind them. Um, again, this is not something that really will work with all art styles, but um, if you are going for something that's a little bit more like, for example, a uh, PlayStation One aesthetic. Uh, or a Nintendo 64 aesthetic, this this might be something worth considering. Um, if I go back to my uh, to my draw code, I'm still actually sorting the objects based on depth. If I were to not sort the objects based on depth, um, which maybe would prove the point a little bit better, uh, this is still going to work because we don't actually have any alpha blending anymore. Uh, nothing is being alpha blended. We just have uh, pixels that are being drawn or discarded. And... Um, Definitely saves on some effort of doing that sorting. By the way, another uh, thing to compare this to, if you've ever seen like transparency in quotes uh, done on an old video game console like the NES uh, via basically strobing a sprite on or off uh, every other frame at 60 hertz, that's pretty similar to what we're doing here, except while the like strobing pattern transparency is uh, more of a temporal solution where the entire sprite is either being drawn or not drawn, uh, what we're doing here is more of a spatial solution, where only a certain percentage of pixels in a given region are drawn uh, based on the, desi des the desired transparency. And it is possible to also do transparency by strobing like that. I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, if your frame rate drops below like 60, it'll just look bad. And at least with certain types of images and certain um, color schemes, strobing effects can can give some people headaches, which you probably want to avoid. Anyway, one last thing before I go. This is really all there is to uh, to say about screen door transparency, but uh, just to drive the point home in one more way, I'm going to just send a um, basically a global alpha to every object in the scene uh, as it's drawn uh, so that we can see with a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more fine detail, exactly how this screen door transparency trick is going to work uh, with different levels of alpha. This is actually not something I've tested, and this is something I'm going to be finding out exactly how good or bad it looks like right now on the spot. So if I were to, uh, before I draw all these things, uniform shader get uniform shader 3D stuff, uh, the name is going to be alpha. And then if I were to shader set uniform float, Uh, that alpha uniform and the value I'm just gonna make the value like the say the sign of or how about the degree sign of current time divided by 10 or something like that uh, times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 just to remap it into the range of 0 to 1 from minus 1 to positive 1 and this should create a uh, basically a fading in and out effect of the whole scene and now uh with the uh, the transparency of each of these objects being modified over time uh we can see exactly how this looks when uh, transparency is changing over time for whatever reason and honestly for as simple as this is and for the fact that we're not actually doing anything with alpha uh this isn't terrible we can also sort of see as they come back as they pop in and out of existence sort of like a fizzling pattern um I've definitely seen this sort of effect in games before. Sometimes people call it things like the Thanos snap because it kind of looks like uh, the um, that one scene in that one movie where the purple guy like snapped his fingers and uh, a bunch of people just like fizzled into smoke. Another thing you might notice is that now uh, even 100% opaque surfaces have a little bit of a dither pattern on them, like a little bit of simulated transparency. And that's just because uh, due to the way that the sine wave works and the way that it's sampled over time, um, it's going to be pretty rare for, like, the alpha value of any given pixel to actually be, like, 100%. It's far more likely that the alpha is going to, like, come to rest at something like 0.999957328, whatever. So, if you do something like this, it might be a good idea to, like, build in a bit of a buffer at 100%, at or around 100%, but that is going to be a stylistic choice for you to make. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. My name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games. If you want the code for this, look for the GitHub repository down in the description of the video. Assuming I don't forget to post the link again.
I do like to post videos on all kinds of weird stuff that you can do in Game Maker, so if anything like this appeals to you, feel free to subscribe. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute to the channel, links to that can be found in all the usual places. You should all go check out Wizard X and the Lost Hat, which is one of the games that I like to work on when I'm not doing YouTube stuff. Link to that can be found down below as well. I hope you all enjoyed that, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Zenjamin, Zach Robinson, Square Crow, Spy Die Games, Pixelated Pope, Manta Ray, Game Maker, Game Mart Indie, Edward Holt, DJ Gibbles, Brenton, and Boketa for supporting these videos. If you want to contribute to the channel, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.